Tonight on Y News. Palace sees nothing wrong with Pogo hubs near a military camp, even after a law national security. A maritime law expert says China counters its own policy after Chinese warships without informing authorities. Chinese paramilitary continue to hold exercises near Hong Kong border. And self-driving vehicles to be used for the 30th Southeast Asian Games hosted by the Philippines. A senator is dismayed with the unannounced passage of Chinese warships in the Cebu Strait in Tawi-Tawi. A maritime law expert says this just shows China's double standard when its vessels entered Philippine territory. Nel Maribohok will tell us why. Senator Juan Miguel Subiri does not approve the passage of Chinese ships in Philippine waters. The Cebuto Strait in Tawi-Tawi is an international sea route and is within the Philippine territory. He believes that any foreign ship must get consent from the Philippine government. Well, hindi dapat tayo pumayag niyan. Pag may ganung klaseng pagpasok ng uh, foreign ships, hindi lang po dapat sa China. But any ship, may it be Taiwanese ship, uh, Chinese ship, or Japanese ship, Korean ship, even American ships, they should coordinate with our Navy, they should coordinate with our armed forces, with our government, with the DFA. According to the Senator, it is high time to strengthen the Philippine Navy to secure our territorial waters. May bago po tayo yung barko na darating, uh, dalawa yata, Korean frigates. So, galing po sa South Korea. So yan, makakatulong po yan sa ating mga uh, Navy personnel para sa pagpatrolya ng ating uh, napakalawak na uh, archipelago. Director of the University of the Philippines Institute for Maritime Affairs and Law of the Sea, Professor Jay Batumbakal, in a Facebook post, says that under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, or UNCLOS, warships are entitled to the right of innocent passage if this will not be prejudicial to the peace, good order, or security of the coastal state. But warships should provide notification prior to entering Philippine waters. Chinese warships, he said, clashes with their own policy and demonstrate double standard when they enter Philippine waters without any prior notice to Philippine authorities. China requires foreign warships that exercise innocent passage to notify them and seek consent. Batumbakal says the Chinese warship's action runs counter the maritime safety regulations of the Philippines. Nel Maribuho, UNTV News and Rescue, Pasay City. Some lawmakers have expressed concern that some Pogo hubs are located near military camps. But Malacanang says it is better that way. Rosalie Cos explains why. When asked about the report of building Philippine offshore gaming operators or Pogo hubs near military camps, Presidential Spokesperson Secretary Salvador Panelo said, Military camps, they are good. They are in military camps. They are not being abandoned in the military for their protection. Despite this statement, the palace official lets the National Security Advisor to assess if there is any national security concern related to this. For Defense Secretary Delfin Lorenzana, Secretary Panelo's suggestion is valid, but says it is not the military's job to watch or protect Pogo workers. However, if requested, the military are ready to provide assistance, he adds. It is Pagcor Chairman and Chief Executive Officer Andrea Domingo who said that Pogo Hobbs will provide convenience for foreign workers. He said Pogo Hobbs will serve as a one-stop shop since various government agencies will be accessible through them, such as Pagcor, Department of Labor and Employment, and the Bureau of Internal Revenue. Malacanang supports the position of Philippine Amusement and Gaming Corporation or PADCOR to have Pogo hubs confine Chinese workers and ensure their security and not prevent their liberty. So if their liberties are not restricted, and according to them, ginagawa nga nila to protect them. Yes, sir. Oh, so kung ganun naman ang essence ng paglagay sa kanilang lugar, I don't think that, that will be a violation. The Chinese embassy is concerned about the plan and appeals to the Philippine government to hold Pogo or Philippine casinos that illegally hire Chinese workers. The workers are allegedly abused and subjected to modern slavery. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue, Malacanya.
Self-driving vehicles will surprise athletes at the Southeast Asian Games the Philippines will host this year. Leslie Widem tells us why. Three self-driving electronic coast P1 shuttles will be available for use by players who will represent their countries at the 30th SEA Games. The Basis Conversion and Development Authority or BCDA has signed an agreement with Coast Autonomous for the vehicles. Now these are cars that run completely independent of any human intervention. A single shuttle can load up to 14 people. Coast Autonomous assures the self-driving vehicles are safe to use. Our technology is really designed to put the pedestrian first, to make the cities more walkable, to make the cities more breathable, okay? to cut down the pollution, to make it so that your kids can walk in the city and get around and build a sense of community. The Philippine government will not spend for the vehicles that will arrive in October for the pilot testing. The sporting venues are now 90% complete according to the Philippine Sports Commission. The four designated clusters or hubs for the sporting events are Clark, Subic, Metro Manila, and other areas including Tagaytay and La Union. The 38th SEA Games will run from November 30 to December 11. Leslie Widem, UNTV News and Rescue, Pampanga. It's a festival times two in a town in Brittany where around hundreds of twins, triplets, and quadruplets of all ages gather to share anecdotes, enjoy music, and play games as they don identical outfits. Mirasol Abogodil will tell us why. By twos, threes, and even fours, sets of siblings gathered in a French town to celebrate the annual Twins Festival. The town of Plucaduc in France Brittany region has been hosting the unique festival since 1994. Alan Lunay, the mayor of Plucaduc, founded the festival in honor of his twin daughters Cecile and Aureli. I noticed from early on, and my wife too, the twins like meeting other twins. They have a special sort of language. They understand each other straight away. Triplets and even quadruplets were among the crowd. Many family sets dressed identically as they enjoyed music and friendly competitions. On our birthday, we decided to make a puzzle. I wanted to buy her a puzzle with a photo from our holiday last year, and she ended up giving me the same puzzle with the same photo, without having to talk about it. The sibling groups shared their story, in some cases, talking about how they met spouses at the event over the years. This year, the town treated guests to a parade, meet and greet sessions, musical performances, games, and a disco. Around 12,458 twin births, 167 triplet births, and 8 quadruplet births were recorded in France in 2017, comprising more than 17% of total births an INSEE study found. Mirasol Abogadil, UNTV News and Rescue. Welcome back to Why News. We pick up to where Angelo Castro III left off. I'm Alex Baltazar, and here are the headlines. The House of Representatives Committee on Transportation Chairman seeks a one-year roadmap to solve traffic woes on EDSA. The Manila Metro Rail Transit System 3 saw record low ridership revenue collection in four years in 2018. Marikina City fully complies with the 60-day deadline to clear roads and sidewalks of obstructions in the city. Pagasa officially declares El Nino phenomenon over. And videos of parents supportive of their children go viral. Good evening. The Metropolitan Manila Development Authority expects that the traffic situation on ETSA will get worse in the coming days. But the lower house may have one of the solutions to the traffic woes. Grace Cousin reports why. 
MMDA Traffic Chief Edison Bong Nebdiha, the volume of vehicles that traverse EDSA these days is the same as that every December. As bad as the situation now, they expect it to get even worse. Ito August pa lang, ganyan na yung, ano natin, eh, yung travel speed natin. So, uh, well, it's something to look into kung ano talaga yung mga cost kaya nagpapa-volume count na kami para makuha namin yung actual count even before the entry of the Burmans. As a number of proposals have been presented by various parties and agencies, the House Committee on Transportation is working on a centralized dispatching system to address the traffic situation on EDSA in one year. With a centralized dispatching system, all city bus franchise will be consolidated into one, and the dispatching of the bus units will be controlled. Ito po, kung galing ka ng Norte, Ang bus iikot lang, babalik isang direksyon sa Norte, babalik rin yung sa Norte. Pag bababa, pupunta ka ng Fairview, bababa ka at sasakay ka rin sa ibang carousel, papunta naman ng Fairview lang ang biyahe. Buses will be allowed to stop for one minute at designated bus stops near LRT and MRT stations. For convenience, electronic cards or beep cards will be used for paying fares. The proposal also pushes for the strict implementation of fixed salary for drivers and conductors. Grace Cassin, UNTV News and Rescue, Caloacan City. 80 barangays in Quezon City are now obstruction-free, while Marikina is proud to say all public roads and sidewalks in the city are now clear 100%. Joanna tells us why. Before the DILG 60-day deadline arrives, Marikina City Mayor Marcy Chidoro announces they have totally cleared the roads and sidewalks of obstructions. Ang uh, ginagawa ng Marikina ngayon ay maintenance na. Kaya based on the assessment ng uh, uh, compliance team ng DILG sa Marikina, the Interior Department orders the Marikina City Government to submit a report on how they were able to accomplish the challenge. Ang Marikina, talagang noon pa kasi naipatupad na nila yung no obstruction. Eh. Ang, uh, ang maganda yung Marikina, paglabas mo ng bangketa, hindi na sa'yo yan. Pag-aari na ng publiko yan. Kaya walang hari ng bangketa doon. Ang ganda. Uh, dapat basunda natin yung ginawa ng Marikina. On the other hand, Quezon City Mayor Joy Belmonte says around 80 barangays in the city are now free of obstructions. The challenge now is maintenance. The plan now is to enforce stiffer policies against illegal parking. Magpaprint tayo na maraming violation tickets. 17 barangay offices in the city need to be dismantled. The DILG will hold a meeting next week to assess the metrowide clearing operations and to identify the areas that need further clearing. John Anu, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. The Metro Rail Transit Line 3's ridership and ticket sales went down last year, which was the lowest in four years, according to the Commission on Audit. Arlene Delgado reports why. Based on the Commission on Audit or COA's annual audit report last year, the number of passengers in MRT3 went down by 26%. From 140.15 million passengers in 2017 to 104.28 million in 2018. Ticket sales also went down by over 700,000 pesos. From 2.78 billion pesos in 2017 to 2.07 billion pesos last year. The reason for these COA sales is that only 13 out of 24 train sets operated, which the riding public find inconvenient. The Commission also points out the 48 Dalian trains delivered in 2017 remain inoperable, despite the independent safety audit and assessment by TUV Rainland Philippines. COA recommends to the MRT3 management to impose liquidated damages on the delays of the Dalian contractor. The Department of Transportation took over the maintenance of the train system after it terminated a service contract with Busan Universal Rail Incorporated or Booty in November 2017 due to poor service. Booty was supposed to overhaul 40 trains but only finished three which broke down afterwards. Koa suggests that the system must be improved, noting it would be disadvantageous to the government to spend more for the subsidy to pay equity rentals to the Metro Rail Transit Corporation or MRTC. The MRT3 has been under rehabilitation, targeted to be finished next year. The UNTV News and Rescue is still waiting for the MRT3 management's official statement. Harleen Delgado, UNTV News and Rescue, Kazan City. 
Manila Mayor Isko Moreno confirms one of the Manila market operators he warned three days ago paid half of its unpaid obligations to the city government. April Sinadosa explains why. The Market Life Management and Leasing Corporation asked for 30 days to pay half of their debt to the Manila City Government. Market Life is the operator of Quinta Market and Fishport, also known as Quiapo Market. In his capital report today, Mayor Isco Moreno presented the operator's check payment, which amounts to over 4.9 million pesos. Ito, two years din, ha? hindi nagbayad. Two years din, hindi nagbayad. Ito po, oh, bayad sila. Oh, isang 195,000 oh, at isang 4.750 million. The local chief executive also showed the check payment of the Visori Mall's operator which amounts to over 10 million pesos. Yesterday, market operator XRC Mall Developers Incorporated paid their 12.9 million peso tax deficit. XRC operates Santa Ana Market, San Andres Market, Sampaloc Market, and Trabajo Market. On August 13, Mayor Isko Moreno gave three days to market operators to pay their 25 million peso guaranteed annual revenue, which was not remitted in 2017. The contracts of the operators will be rendered invalid should they fail to pay their debts. April Senadoza, UNTV News and Rescue, Manila. The number of dengue cases in Metro Manila exceeds the Health Department's dengue alert threshold. The Health Secretary says this is not the time to be complacent. Aiko Miguel tells us why. From January to August 10 this year, the National Capital Region recorded more than 11,000 dengue cases. This is 33% higher compared to the previous five years. It's uh, starting to uh, rise. Uh, and just like the other regions that began with, uh, with uh, alert uh, uh, levels, naging epidemic level na sila. Pwede pa rin sumipa ang dengue. Kaya hindi po tayo pwede na magpa, magpahinay-hinay. Paranaque, Malabon, Taguig, Makati and Mandaluyong are among the cities in the NCR where dengue cases have spiked. The health department clarifies that no medicine, supplements or vaccine have been proved to cure dengue. The DOH supports the science and technology department's move to fund the distribution of food supplements which may help increase the people's platelets in order to avoid dengue. Wala namang gamot ang uh, dengue. Wala rin bakuna. At kung meron man silang uh, inaalay na mga uh, sinasabing mga makakagabot, hindi po totoo yan. Ito po ay uh, food supplement lamang. At kinakailangan, meron siyang FDA Certificate of Product Registration. The DOH continues to remind the public to clean their surroundings and eradicate dengue mosquito breeding places. This is through the 4 o'clock habit using the forest strategy. Search and destroy self-protection. Seek early consultation and support space praying. Aiko Miguel, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. Five informants received monetary reward from the Armed Forces of the Philippines and the Philippine National Police. Vincent Arboleda explains why. 14 million and 250,000 pesos. These are the rewards tipsters got from the AFP and the PNP for giving information against terror leaders. The reward system is of course uh, determined jointly by the Armed Forces of the Philippines and the Philippine National Police through an approved letter directive uh, from the Office of the President. AFP Chief of Staff General Benjamin Madrigal adds, the amount of reward is based on the level of crimes the suspects committed. Among the communist terrorist leaders arrested are Victor Tisorio of the 1st Deputy Secretary and Commanding Officer of Northern and Eastern Luzon, CNT Leader Promencio Cortez, the head military staff and Secretary of Guerrilla, Committer in Shangri-La Ilocos Cordillera Regional Committee, Diomedes Apinado, the Deputy Secretary and Vice Commander of Platoon Session in OAS Albay, Mauricio Sagun, the Head Training ROC Military Staff in Iligan City, Isabela, and CNT Leader Jaime Soledad, former Secretary of Southern Lady Front Committee of Eastern Visayas. The Armed Forces of the Philippines is grateful for all the informants whose help and cooperation 
became vital in the neutralization of these criminals who were responsible for heinous and atrocious crimes against the people and our nation. The AFP also calls on the public to help fight terrorism. Vincent Arboleda, UNTV News and Rescue. The long wait is over for the Dabawenyo fans of Moira de la Torre as the Braver concert begins in Azuela Cove, seaside Lanang, Davao City. From Davao City, here is Janice Iñente to tell us why live. Good evening, Janice. Yes, Alex, I am here in the Crown Jewel of Mindanao for Moira's Braver concert which began just an hour ago. The gates opened at 4 p.m. and excited wishers and moisters arrived here with their wonderful cheer awaiting a spectacular experience with their favorite artist, no other than Moira. Local artists performed their original song compositions as opening acts. Wishful Princess and Wishful Kimberly are also here in Davao City and they performed their chosen pieces to bring the audience the lively bites. During a press conference yesterday, Moira shared that Davao City represents a big part of her music life when she was still a struggling artist. For this, she is excited to share the Davao to Davaoenos her new compositions. R&B King JR and I Belong to the Zoo vocalist RG Guerrero will perform together with Moira on stage for a surprise song number. Of course, we will we will hear original Pinoy music which we Wish 1075 promotes all over the world. This uh, Braver concert in Davao City is presented through Wish 1075 as part of the FM station's 5th anniversary celebration. That's the latest here in Davao City. Back to you, Alex. Thank you, Janice Iñente, reporting live from Davao City. Videos of parents who show support to their children in their own little ways go viral on social media. Monok Son tells us why. Respect, trust, love. Virtues we show to our parents, which they themselves first showed to us. From nine months in our mother's womb, they change our diapers, feed us good foods, send us to school, watch us grow. Real parental love seems to never end. Look at this mom. She's old to be in a football field, but she prefers to be with his son, who plays football. She shows much energy to cheer for his boy. In return, his son plays at his best. While this lady appears to be a service crew in this restaurant, she isn't. She does this to help her daughter, a service crew, because she knows her beloved will be tired from working. So, she wants to at least ease her daughter's weariness. But some minors seem to have forgotten all the things their parents did for them from their infancy. Let's ask some people what are their points of view on this. Kasi para sa akin, iba-iba rin po yung ano eh. Iba yung kalidad ng buhay ko to sa kalidad ng buhay ng mga bata po doon. Kaya kanya-kanya po yung desisyon ng nagagawa mo. Sa totoo po yun, kahit masama po yung ano, yung trato sa atin ng magulang natin. May utang na loob pa rin po kasi binuway po tayo, pinalaki po tayo. Eh, depende yun sa anak. May anak kung tumata na o may anak na hindi. Eh, mostly ngayon eh, parang hindi na ganun. Uh, meron pa rin tayong obligasyon sa parents natin kasi pinalaki nila tayo and pinag-aaral. We can find a lot of friends, but there can never be more than our two parents. It's high time to remind ourselves how far can our love for our parents go. Mon Hoxon, UNTV News and Rescue. And to complete the most significant news for this day, why news continues, here are the top stories. The weak El Nino, which started in the last quarter of 2018, has finally ended. Ray Pelayo will tell us why. The climate in the eastern equatorial Pacific is back to normal after the occurrence of the El Nino phenomenon. According to the Philippine Atmospheric, Geophysical and Astronomical Services Administration or Pagasa, the sea surface temperature in the eastern equatorial Pacific has normalized and it is projected to remain 
until the end of this year. Oriental Mindoro and Sultan Kudrat experienced meteorological drought in the past 3 to 5 months. Normal rainfall is expected this month in Calabar Zone, Mimaropa, Bicol Region, Metro Manila, most parts of Eastern Visayas, the provinces of Nueva Vizcaya, Quirino, Bataan, Aurora, Agusan del Norte, and Surigao del Norte. Based on the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council's report on June 27, 2019, the worth of damages to agriculture caused by El Nino reached almost 8 billion pesos. This is aside from the water service interruption experienced in Metro Manila due to a depleted water supply from Angat Dam whose water level is below the 180 meter minimum operating level. As of 6 a.m. today, the water in Angat Dam reached a height of 177.12 meters, higher than its 176.72 meter level yesterday. National Water Resources Board Executive Director Sevilla David said Metro Manila's water allocation may be increased to 40 cubic meters next month from 36 cubic meters this month. Ray Pilayo, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. Meanwhile, the government's loan program for farmers is set to begin in September according to the Department of Agriculture. The financial assistance aims at helping local farmers to cope with the impact of the rice tarification law, especially since the price of palay plummeted from 20 pesos per kilogram last year to just 14 pesos per kilogram this year. Farmers who are owners of farmlands one hectare and smaller are qualified to avail for the 15,000 peso loan, which they can pay in a span of eight years. According to Agriculture Secretary William Dar, the National Food Authority will then purchase the local farmers' palay harvest while they are enrolled in the loan program. German and Swiss scientists have published a study suggesting that microplastic is being blown vast distances through the air and dumped when it snows, underscoring the threat the growing form of pollution poses to marine life, even the remotest waters on the planet. Lena Ramos explains why. A team of scientists from the Alfred Wegener Institute analyzed snow samples in Germany, the Swiss Alps, and on the Norwegian Arctic archipelago of Svalbard to confirm that the snow in all places contained high concentrations of plastic fragments, known as microplastic. The highest concentration in samples was collected in a rural area in Germany's southern province of Bavaria, totaling to 154,000 particles per liter. The snow in the Arctic contained up to 14,400 particles per liter in comparison. The study published on Wednesday is reinforced by research conducted by a U.S.-led team of scientists in the Northwest Passage. The team found a material trap in ice taken from Lancaster Sound, an isolated stretch of water in the Canadian Arctic which they had assumed might be relatively sheltered from drifting plastic pollution. And so we're seeing, you know, plastics of different colors and different geometries, these beads and the filaments again, and we don't know yet what the, what the composition of the plastic is, but I think uh, even knowing what uh, we knew about the concurrence of plastic in ice and, and the ubiquity of plastic. 18 ice cores of up to 6.5 feet long were drawn from four locations. It was kind of a, a punch to the stomach to um, see what looked like a, a normal sea ice core uh, in such a beautiful, pristine environment, but just chock full of this, of this um, uh, material, which is completely foreign to the to the environment. The plastic fragments serve to highlight how the waste problem has reached epidemic proportions. The United Nations estimates that 100 million tons of plastic have been dumped in the oceans to date. Lena Ramos, UNTV News and Rescue. And for the news abroad, North Korea has rejected any further talks with South Korea calling its decision completely the fault of South Korea's actions. Kaftumaraos reports why. 
North Korea fired two more unidentified projectiles into the sea off its east coast on Friday morning, South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff said in a statement. The South Korean military said the projectiles were fired from near the city of Tongchon of Gangwon province into the East Sea, also known as the Sea of Japan. It was the sixth round of launches since last month, with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un labeling them a solemn warning over U.S.-South Korean joint military drills that began earlier this month. Earlier, North Korea said it will never sit down with South Korea for talks again, rejecting a vow by the South Korea's President Moon Jae-in to pursue dialogue with Pyongyang made the previous day as he pledged to bring in unification by 2045. North Korea has always been infuriated by the war games, decrying them as rehearsals for an attack. South Korea's unification ministry said that North Korea's rejection for talks again does not correspond with inter-Korean agreements. Seoul's unification ministry urged North Korea to join the dialogue and added that talks are the only way to implement the Panmunjom Declaration and Pyongyang Joint Declaration. The talks between South Korea and North Korea are the only way of implementing an inter-Korean joint declaration and we can also deliver our opinions as much as we can at these meetings. This is our unchangeable stance and we urge North Korea to respond positively. Kat Dumaraos, UNTV News and Rescue. Rhode Island's Attorney General and State Police launched investigations Thursday after a truck drove through a group protesting federal immigration policies at a detention center, which has since placed an employee on leave. A video posted by the group in social media shows a black pickup that protesters say was operated by a uniformed corrections officer driving up to an entrance blocked by demonstrators. The vehicle stops before again moving forward. Protesters suffering the effects of what appears to be pepper spray can be seen in later videos filmed by the demonstrators. At least two people were injured, one seriously Wednesday night outside the Donald W. Wyatt detention facility in Central Falls, according to the Jewish youth, youth movement, Never Again Action. The center is used by U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Israel announced it was barring the entry of two Democratic U.S. Congresswomen in the country after U.S. President Donald Trump encouraged the move. Beverly Sison explains why. Israel will bar a visit by two of its sharpest critics in the U.S. Congress, Democrats Rashida Tlaib and Ilan Omar, who plan to tour the occupied West Bank and East Jerusalem, the country's deputy foreign minister said on Thursday. U.S. President Donald Trump had earlier urged Israel on Thursday not to allow the visit by Tlaib and Omar, the first two Muslim women elected to Congress and members of the Democratic Party's progressive wing. So uh, I did absolutely put out a very strong statement. I think. If you look at their language, if you look at what they've said, if I ever said it, it would be, uh, it would be a horrible, it would be a horrible month, to put it mildly. So the things that they've said, uh, Omar, Talib, what they've said is uh, disgraceful. So I can't imagine why Israel would let them in, but if they want to let them in, they can, but I can't imagine why they would do it. The pair have voiced support for the pro-Palestinian boycott, divestment, sanctions, or BDS movement. Under Israeli law, backers of the BDS movement can be denied entry to Israel. Trump has vented in recent months against Omar Tlaib and two other Democratic Congresswomen of color, accusing them of hostility to Israel in what has widely been seen as drumming up of Republican votes for his 2020 re-election bid. Israel's ambassador in the United States, Ron Dermer, said last month Tlaib and Omar would be let in out of respect for the U.S. Congress and the U.S.-Israeli relationship. Political commentators said a reversal of Israel's original intention to approve the legislators' entry likely stemmed from a desire to mirror Trump's hard line against them. No date had been formally announced for the Congresswomen's trip, but sources familiar with the planned visit said it could begin at the weekend. Beverly Saison, UNTV News and Rescue, USA. Hundreds of members of China's People Armed Police continue to conduct exercises on Friday at a sports stadium in Shenzhen. 
paramilitary soldiers could be seen marching and holding anti-riot drills outside of the Shenzhen Bay Sports Center. Hundreds of armored vehicles remain parked on surrounding streets. The Shenzhen Stadium sits across the water from Hong Kong's rural, rural hinterland near a bridge straddling the border. Chinese state media have made several mentions of exercises in Shenzhen. The U.S. State Department expressed concern on Wednesday, August 14, that the People's Armed Police could be deployed across the border in Hong Kong to break up protests racking the city. Protesters on the front line of demonstrations in Hong Kong have said they are willing to give up their lives in their bid for democracy and maintaining the one country, two systems formula amid protests that have roiled the territory for the past 10 weeks. Ferdi Pataglia explains why. One of the frontline protesters, Along, a nickname that means dragon, represents a growing number of discontented Hong Kong youth fueling a fast-changing protest movement that has taken a revolutionary cast. Along spent his day working in a trading company and his nights facing off against the riot police. He declined to give his real name. I don't have any confidence in both Chinese and Hong Kong government. Under the one country, two systems formula, China promised Hong Kong that it would enjoy autonomy for 50 years after its handover from Britain in 1997. For young protesters born after the handover, that deadline will fall in the middle of their lives. Putting on body gear purchased from a motorbike shop, which include mask, helmet, as well as arm, body, and leg protection in a small apartment in the Sam Shui Pu neighborhood. Ah Leung said he is ready for a night of protest that would become one of the most violent Hong Kong has seen up to now. Our youngsters have nothing to lose. We have no big dependence on people and we have no properties. If we fail, we would pay with our lives. The protesters and their supporters come from a broad cross-section of society, rich and poor, male and female, young and old, making the city a tinderbox that could ignite at any moment. The protesters speak in increasingly desperate terms and violence has become widely accepted as a principle of resistance by many of them. On that Sunday afternoon, Riot police rushed out and fired tear gas at the bustling street of Sam Shui Po and arrested some people. Rather than make a stand, the group of several hundred decided to evacuate as tear gas rounds boomed in the distance. Zawa shouted black clad leaders in the crowd, exhorting the other protesters to run away in Cantonese. They then swiftly changed locations, their fluid movement becoming a steely and creative resistance to Chinese rule that has rattled the Communist Party. Be water has been the mantra of the protesters, a phrase borrowed from the Hong Kong movie star Bruce Lee, who used it to describe his Kung Fu philosophy. It is a call for flexibility and creativity, moving forward when there's an opportunity to press an advantage and flowing away when a strategic retreat is needed. Its latest manifestation has been the series of wildcat protests that have spread across the city in recent weeks. When police turn up in numbers at one protest, the activists engage them to tie up officers and then melt away to another neighborhood where they repeat the process. Our protection gears cannot fight against the police's weapons. That's why we can only use flash mob to split the police's power to make them feel tired and go back. This is all we can do. While the movement clearly is being supported by established pro-democracy activists, one of the striking features of the recent protest has been the sight of activists like Ah Leung, clad head to toe in black protective gear, rallying other protesters to move forward, or retreat, or set off to the next flash mob protest in another district. Unlike Occupy, which pushed for the rather lofty goal of universal suffrage, the extradition bill was more tangible, the protesters say, uniting those who had remained silent for years. If you ask me, I can say any frontliner is scared. But are we afraid of being arrested or losing our homes? We are afraid of losing our home called Hong Kong. For the Petalio, UNTV News and Rescue, Hong Kong. Operatives of the National Bureau of Investigation arrested one of Senator Laila Dilima's Senator 
Laila Delima's drug-related cases in Angeles, Pampanga. Her lawyer says this is a welcome development. Roderick Mendoza explains why. A co-accused of Senator Laila Dilima in two of her drug cases was finally arrested today by the National Bureau of Investigation in Angeles, Pampanga. Jose Adrian Dera, also known as Jad Dera, went into hiding for over two years after the Muntilupa Trial Court ordered his arrest. In its indictment, the Department of Justice accused Dera of being Dilima's nephew and conduit and receiving drug money from inmates in New Bilibid Prison. He was allegedly used by then Justice Secretary de Lima to extort 10 million pesos and four vehicles from Peter Ko for her 2016 senatorial campaign. De Lima has denied the allegations, saying she is not in any way related to Dera and that he has never worked for her. She also denied accepting money or any vehicle from Ko. In a motion filed with the court, Dera also denied working for de Lima. He said the DOJ presented no evidence to support its claim that he acted as Dilima's middleman. There was also no documents presented such as the registration of the course allegedly taken from Ko. Even the NBA admitted that they found no link or evidence connecting him to Senator Dilima. Hindi siya alalay, hindi siya aid, hindi siya pamangkin. Dilima's lawyer said it's highly improbable for Dara to recant his previous statements as these are already part of court records. Definitely makakatulong sa defense ni Senator Dilima kasi siya na mismo mag magdi-deny na uh, siya'y ginamit ni Senator Dilima para mag-extort ng pera sa mga inmates. Dara is set to be arraigned on September 3. Roderick Mendoza, UNTV News and Rescue. Russia is sending its first humanoid robot to the International Space Station. Meanwhile, Japan has an unusual solution for people prone to tripping or losing their balance, a robotic tail. Vincent Arboleda will tell us why. Our research team at Japan's Keio University have built a robotic, one they say could help unsteady elderly people keep their balance. Dubbed ARC, the gray one-meter device mimics tails such as those of cheetahs and other animals used to keep their balance while running and climbing, according to the KO team. While other nations have turned to immigrant workers to replenish a shrinking workforce, less welcoming Japan has focused more on a technological solution. The robotic tail, which uses four artificial muscles and compressed air to move in eight directions, will remain in the lab for now, however, as researchers look for ways to make it more flexible. Apart from helping the elderly get around, the team are also looking at industrial applications for the artificial appendage, such as a balance aid for warehouse workers carrying heavy loads. Russia's space agency Roscosmos has released a video of a robot, Skybot F850, being prepared for a trip to the International Space Station. Footage shows the robot manipulating different objects and performing moves with mechanical hands, but with assistance from a human operator. According to Roscosmos, the robot can do several activities on its own, like grabbing objects or doing push-ups, but will still be overseen by a human during the space mission. In 2017, Skybot F850 was shown to the Russian President Vladimir Putin shooting pistols with both hands. The launch date is set to August 22. Vincent Arboleda, UNTV, News and Rescue. A group of teenagers in Nigeria showed it is not the sophisticated equipment that makes a great movie, but its creativity and perseverance. Nina Armilio will tell us why. In a compound in Nigeria's northwestern state of Kaduna, Godwin Yosia and his cousins hang green fabric on a gate as they get ready to shoot a movie scene. Using a smartphone and a tripod made from a broken microphone stand, they start filming. A blower generates wind which hits the actor, who in the film will be flying through the air. These days, sci-fi films are made using sophisticated software, but the films created by these boys use everyday recycled items and their works have catapulted them into social media darlings. Well, the main aim was not for our stuff to go viral. We just wanted people to see that, okay, there are kids in Kaduna doing something 
different. So that was just the main aim. So it all of a sudden just happening. It's it blew our mind. Um, it made us happy. The crew of Eight call themselves the Critics Company. They released their first film, Redemption, in 2016 after saving for a month to buy the green fabric for the chroma key and teaching themselves how to do visual effects by watching tutorials on YouTube. Battling slow internet and power cuts, they created a tale about two boys who create an organic biofuel. The student filmmakers have found their niche with sci-fi. The 20 short movies or 10 minutes or less they have produced are mostly about superheroes. No costs are involved as they do everything themselves but they have to keep their work short or it would take too long to upload. Their efforts impressed Nollywood movie producer Kemi Aditiba so much, she tweeted enthusiastically about them in June. The students known online as the Critics 001 have since gone viral. A funding campaign for the boys amassed donations of about 5,000 US dollars and they're now on their way to upgrading their equipment. Yosia now has his sights on making it in Nollywood, Nigeria's multi-million dollar sector, and is ranked second largest in the world after Bollywood by quantity of films produced. But the target we aim for in the years to come is to make the biggest films in Nigeria and probably beyond. That's just the main aim. We want to do something crazy, we want to do something great, something that has not been known before. And from what has been going on now, we, we believe quite well it's going to happen soon enough. The boys are now busy working on a new film, but they cannot disclose the plot until it's finished. Nina Armilio, UNTV News and Rescue. And those are the reasons behind the news this August 16, 2019. On behalf of Alex Baltazar and Angelo Castro III, I am William Theo, and before we close, we will recap with today's significant sound bites. Because we need to know, we will always ask why. Good evening. Even the NBA admitted that they found no link or evidence connecting him to Senator De Lima. Hindi siya alalay, hindi siya aid, hindi siya pamangkin. Military camps nila nung magaling. Kung nasa military camps, ayaw na binabantay sila sa military for their protection. Ang Marikina talagang noon pa kasi naipatupad na nila yung no obstruction eh. Ang, uh, ang maganda yung Marikina, paglabas mo ng bangketa, hindi na sa'yo yan. Pag-aari na ng publiko yan. Kaya walang hari ng bangketa doon. Ang ganda. Uh, dapat basunda natin yung ginawa ng Marikina. Pwede pa rin sumipa ang dengue. Kaya hindi po tayo pwede na magpahinay-hina, hindi po tayo uh, magpapakampante. Kahit na mababa pa tayo ngayon compared to last year, pero meron na tayong alert threshold status. Ito, two years din ha, hindi nagbayad. Ito po, oh, bayad sila. Oh, isang 195,000 oh, at isang 4.750 million.